it's Tuesday the 31st of October so uh, a few things I want to get you guys up to speed on from uh, some of the news from yesterday which did weigh on US equities and saw likes of the S&P and Dow underperform the Nasdaq some of after some tax reform information that came out in respect to Trump and his plans. Uh, then there's some Asian data overnight. We have the Bank of Japan interest rate decision, some Chinese PMI numbers. We've had quite a few earnings out of UK and European firms this morning. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of a look ahead because there's some important European data forthcoming for the session. So that's what the briefing is going to entail, hopefully, uh, as it goes through the next 20 minutes or so. So first of all, starting off with the... I guess let's have a look at the close on Wall Street last night. And there was a bit of a, a disparity between the S&P and the Dow, both of which were down about uh, 0.35% or so. However, the Nasdaq outperformed and was up about a quarter percent. So some outperformance in the tech names. Uh, you might have read yesterday, uh, Apple shares uh, finishing in decent positive territory, latest being in regards to the demand for the iPhone 10, now said to be actually pretty good. And, and so market investors kind of uh, buying into those shares in respect of that. And looking at the other indices though, a uh, little bit different because we had a bit of underperformance in the US broader market and the S&P, the kind of benchmark index. Uh, a lot of the selling came, I mean, this was looking at yesterday afternoon and why did that happen well kind of coincided with some comments here about the tax reforms and you guys will know that how much this u.s equity market trading at these all-time high valuations is largely dependent on this promise of um, in particular the kind of out of all the fiscal measures that are concurrently ongoing the corporate tax reform in the u.s is kind of the the, the key headline um, proposal from trump now, this is what came out yesterday from Bloomberg. Uh, House panels talk of phased-in tax cut counters Trump's wishes. So, in summary, ha House tax writers are discussing a phase-in approach for corporate tax cuts, allowing the tax rate to gradually fall from 35%, obviously currently at the moment in 2018, to 20% by 2020. So, it's going to have a 3% per year staggered down effect the thinking being is that they don't just want a one-off bazooka to cause a big jump in u.s economic output in response to that only to then quickly fade away they think the prudent plan would be to phase it in to have a bigger long-term impact from that corporation tax cut and obviously it not being so aggressive i.e uh, reducing the risk then in regards to uh, a big collapse potentially this is the other side of it in in tax receipts for the government this is obviously the opposite of what trump wants trump is obviously a, a kind of wham bam thank you ma'am type of guy and i'm sure you're going to be hearing from him on twitter uh, throughout the coming days as he looks to kind of get the house panel back on track to his way of thinking but this seems to be the latest and obviously this does mean that the uh, the kind of aggressive response by the market uh, is probably lessened by the impact then that a scaling effect would have on underlying market positioning, which has been at this point prior to this information coming out yesterday, that we'd see a dramatic one-off big drop in the corporate tax rate, looking more likely that that might not be the case. And I would say from a logic negotiating point of view to get Congress on the side to back him, you probably this seems a much more prudent plan that would probably get more wide support from congressional members so this is the kind of the first sign of what potentially might be to come in in how what shape and form the corporate tax plan will come so equities did finish a little lower exception the nasdaq because of the predominantly the apple move and, and its large proportion weighting to that index helping prop it up uh, but looking at the s p doesn't really make me feel too nervous about still wanting to remain of a long bias in this market uh, i guess if we were looking uh, entry points at the moment technically on the day ahead and obviously we'd have to reevaluate this in a few hours time when we get closer towards the north american open but more recently here just got above pivot in the s p that kind of low that we printed yesterday before we steadied kind of recovered overnight in asia uh, so you've got that level there could be quite interesting uh, with S1 here at 63 and a quarter, so maybe a stop at that level. 
otherwise alternately or alternatively uh, some other points of interest possibly the friday low before the move up that also matching up pretty much to the t with that s1 level uh, or then even further down down to the low that was seen on thursday so depending i guess on how aggressive you want to be maybe a few entry points still favoring the fact that okay despite what's happened and uh, that caused this kind of movement here i'd say largely now that's priced in to that respect and we've already recovered so um, still feel relatively more bullish than not when it comes to, to US equities in, in that respect. Um, other headlines that we've had, um, let me just bring into shot here. This is the IBEX. So I'm just looking at the CFD here uh, on the IBEX. And you can see here we had a, a big gap up yesterday's price movement right at the open. We pretty much continued that through late morning. US came in, pushed it further broke above the highs that we saw last week and if you start looking on a on a daily continuation for the ibex chart if i just remove some of these studies uh, you can see here in the ibex this was when the the initial vote for independence happened and obviously those extremely violent scenes that were seen in catalonia that was that big red candle here uh, at the beginning of the month and look where we are now in terms of the ibex we are more than recovered that move. We're in fact back to levels not really seen since kind of mid-August. So if there was any concerns here in the domestic market for Spain, they've been pretty short-lived. And the latest with that is Catalonia's independence movement has unraveled uh, as Rajoy has prevailed. So I guess in a sense, um, even though... Um, Rajoy has now seized control of Catalonia's government. What this has done has meant the independence movement has been left leaderless because you probably remember uh, Puigdemont has fled to Brussels while his other kind of senior party officials look to kind of get the party together in a run up to uh, forthcoming elections which have been promised. But I guess it's kind of a the the kind of momentum, if you like, behind this push for. Catalan independence has definitely fizzled out so the federal government's plans have definitely um, won out in the end. Uh, I did see an interesting thing that Deutsche Bank were picking up in local press in Spain, El Mundo, which is one of the main uh, news agencies, reported that opinion polls conducted early last week, this was actually before the independence was declared, show that support for Catalan independence has fallen to 33.5% in the region. So certainly, I guess, after the government has not backed down or made any concession, in fact, has gone the opposite, the most aggressive, and taken full control in invoking that Article 155. Uh, this is obviously very negative connotations for the people who live and work uh, within the Catalan region. Uh, and now, as I say, the, the fact that support is dwindling kind of means that this, this escalation of confrontation between these two areas has now dissipated quite sharply and hence the ibex has has recovered quite comfortably here in more recent trade and that's been reflected in other uh, spanish assets as well so that's the kind of latest on the catalan side uh, overnight we have had a couple of things coming out of asia uh, this was the first thing so mainland china factory pmi data falls from a five-year high on pollution cleanup now would I take this number and, and start thinking about how it's going to influence trade decisions for today? I'd probably say no. The reason for that, because the data was at a five year high. So putting it in context, this is still relatively high, even though it was a slight miss of 51.6 against 52 forecast. Um, looking at the actual pullback here, you can see on the chart, these are some of the highest levels that we've been in this Chinese PMI manufacturing reading for a number of years. So despite the miss, no, I don't think it's going to make people particularly nervous about the prospects for the manufacturing sector in China. Uh, and also you can layer in the fact that there is a, an explainable reason for potentially some of the weakness being that officials increasingly prioritizing a campaign to clamp down on polluting industries and reining in debt. Uh, so it might go some way to, to explain that. The other thing that's happened overnight, and this really hasn't had too much of a, of a sway on the yen because it's, everything's just gone pretty much as planned or as the market's expected. The Bank of Japan, uh, they've kept all their policy on hold. 
Um, they have, though, trimmed their inflation outlook, but this is completely unsurprising. This is exactly in fitting with Bloomberg sources, which were ran at the end of last week. Uh, there was one dissenter, but don't forget this is the new member, uh, Takaoka, I think his name is. I know I usually butcher these names when I try to um, to say them. But what's happened is he also dissented in the last meeting. So again, it's completely as expected. There's no great surprises here. So again, I wouldn't be looking for this to really define market sentiment for the Japanese yen. In fact, for the yen, I'd be more concerned about just trying to pick it up from a more sentiment point of view through the European and, and the US session. Okay, one thing is just seeing the euro stocks turn a little higher here. Uh, there was a little bit of a disparity earlier on. Uh, you can see here the euro stocks just having a look up at that technical level from the previous high. That was the end of last week. Friday morning so we're just having a test up at 36.65 the reason of course I'm looking at the DAX this morning or excuse me the euro stocks is because the DAX is closed uh, reformation day in Germany which means the Deutsche Bourse is closed but Eurex is still open in, in regards to the Bund future which is still trading so no trade in the DAX today uh, but looking at the euro stocks was underperforming earlier comparative to the FTSE but is starting to play a bit of catch up now as we test those previous highs. Um, what was weighing a little bit earlier on this morning were these guys. BNP Paribas had earnings this morning. Uh, the headline would suggest that the banks grow Q3 profits despite a hit to their trading revenues but in terms of their revenues they had fallen 1.8% and they were weaker than expected 10.4 against 10.6 billion expected on the street and so BNP Paribas shares were down about 3% initially at the market open albeit they have seen a little bit of a, a recovery. Now the reason why bank earnings are quite prevalent, French bank earnings specifically, is because this is the uh, the makeup and composition of course that you guys know of the Eurostox 50, the 50th largest companies in Europe. Uh, and particularly here, the country waiting on the right-hand side here on the bar chart is significant. This is because France obviously makes up 36.2% of the Eurostox index. So you do need to be uh, mindful of when there are French earnings in particular if you are looking at the Eurostox index. Uh, it, it does have, in fact, the bigger weighting than that over Germany by a considerable margin. And obviously, if the IBEX does outperform, and if it was a sharp outperforming move, then there is a slight knock-on effect as well, Spain being the third biggest representation within the, the overall Eurostoxx 50 index. Moving over to the FTSE, the FTSE is actually being one of the outperformers in the, uh, the equity space. Comes after BP starts share buyback as profit beats estimates and output surges. BP shares up over 3%, so the opposite of BNP. Uh, and actually, I did see a stat from this morning for BP they're on track for their biggest rise since March of this year. So one of the best starts to the session we've seen in a long time on the back of their corporate earnings. And if you remember, this is then the LSE composition of the FTSE 100. Uh, and in terms of index weighting, uh, there's only a handful of firms that are, have a bigger representation within the FTSE than B BP themselves. BP accounting for just under 5% of the entire FTSE 100 index. Uh, and sometimes, given that this has come out uh, ahead of Royal Dutch Shell, which uh, have actually have an A and B listing, uh, so the market probably already factoring in uh, a decent performance for the energy sector, uh, so likelihood Shell rising in sympathy, but this does also follow positivity we've had for likes of Exxon and Chevron, if you remember on Friday. The energy sector overall in the States as well has performed relatively well, so UK following suit. Okay, quick look. Um, one other chart I just wanted to have a look at was the Bund. Uh, so if I just make this chart a bit bigger. So the reason I want to have a look at this is because of this. I was just looking a little bit longer dated. So this is a 90 minute candlestick on the Bund in the futures. Uh, and really just wanted to look at this area here, which kind of matches up here. And then we've got the initial high that was seen back in uh, very early September I think it was and then the response really from the ECB 
and since we had that obviously big move in the euro currency and we've had that also play out in the fixed income markets where Draghi was uh, despite tightening market took it in a very dovish reaction and buns have just been on a tear since that ECB meeting uh, last week uh, and we're just up testing we've struggled a little bit up at around these mid October highs so quite interesting level just being tested this morning as I said that goes back to a late August high as well if we can get above here then obviously you've got a 163 handle not too far away from the current price uh, and then the, the bigger target overall long term if this trend were to continue be up at those levels uh, that were seen in early September but uh, worth keeping an eye on the Bund and how it responds at around this key level uh, that we're at testing this morning. Where we go from there actually for European assets could be quite interesting because we do have some in, some data coming out uh, of significance from the euro area. Uh, this all coming as a bit of a cluster at 10 o'clock. You can see here probably the headline reading will be the inflation one. You've also got GDP, prelim preliminary readings for Q3, and you've got unemployment rate. I uh, just wanted to have a, uh, well, wanted to show you a few charts of what we're looking at here because it might help explain as to the context of where we lie in a, in a kind of data set historically on the statistics side and then why the ECB is so focused on this inflation issue. So this is EU core inflation. So if you start stripping out likes of energy and food this is kind of the more cleaner reading or the way in which the market will uh, will assess it in that in that respect and as you can see core inflation has been fairly consistent but obviously well short of probably where the ECB would like it to be which is more higher up um, to give them more confidence about their tightening that they're going through now this is a 12 month uh, perspective so obviously core inflation has picked up slightly over the period since kind of Q2 and beyond. However, if you start drawing this out, let's say on a line chart over the course of the last, on a max chart, so this goes back to 2000 where core inflation obviously was peaking up at around 2002, up at around 2.5%. But if you look where the ECB would probably feel more comfortable with tightening with core inflation at least above 1.5%. We've not really been up at that level, not since 2012. And so this is what remains a continued headache for them. Um, but one of the things that they continue to look at, of course, is the labor market. And so this is the EU unemployment rate. And much as the similar argument has been economically in the US about the tightening of the labor force should ultimately start to translate into uh, to wage growth and higher demand and inflationary pressures to materialize from that thereafter. If you're looking at the unemployment rate, this goes to show that thinking in respect to since 2012 and unemployment in the euro area wide peaked at just over 12%. We've come all the way back and steadied down at nine. And if you're thinking about it, then you've got to go back to, if you're looking at 9%, is kind of the average where we were trading in the years in the run-up to then that kind of slight dip before then the financial crisis took hold to 2008-9. So this is why the unemployment situation is not so much specifically as so much of a headache for the ECB, but why they are looking for this then to give them more confidence about inflationary conditions if this trend were continue to, to move lower. The only thing is we have steadied here more recently and it hasn't gone further lower beneath 9%. Uh, we then start looking at growth in the euro area and this is a little bit of a sign of improvement uh, is that if we looked at forward looking surveys like the PMIs that we've seen, multi-year highs and the likes of Germany and France, economic growth has started to emerge, albeit in a fairly slow pace. And this is definitely something which the ECB will be wanting to see continuing to take hold. So you can see here this really severe dip that we had and sharp recovery over the course of the, uh, the initial onset of the global financial crisis and where we are at the moment. And you can see if we were start to push in continuation of this trend, which has been picking up since mid-2016, then if we can push beyond that 2015 high back to kind of the 2009-10 recovery, 1%, that would take us all the way back to pre-2015 
financial crisis level. So this is kind of the how the land lies at the moment for the ECB and what is giving them confidence then to as what we saw uh, last week for them to announce this reduction of their quantitative easing program. So inflation, I'd say, is the one you've really got to look out for with the data. Any downside surprise here, um, we're expecting 1.4% year-on-year, which is a slight 0.1% on the year-on-year -year reading. Uh, I'll see if they've got the... So the X food and energy is expected at 1.2 from 1.3. Uh, obviously, in the, when you're trading euro-dollar, you're not just trading the euro trading the dollar as well and so looking out for further color on the Fed chair announcement will also be pivotal as to that pair's direction but in the short term uh, given the likelihood is it's probably going to be Thursday when we'll hear that Fed chair nominee announcement in with more clarity that's before Trump sets on his Asia tour I'd be looking for this eurozone inflation data to really influence the euro over the course of the morning so that's coming up in just over an hour's time or so uh, so until that point, the euro, I wouldn't be expecting anything from the euro as yet. Market participants will be awaiting that data. Obviously, an upside surprise. You've got plenty of scope to, if we were to retest that high that was printed uh, very late yesterday evening, then you've got the 117 handle above with R1 sitting just above that. Uh, certainly levels in sight given the really big downward move that we saw on the back of the ECB. Um, rate decision. I was pretty surprised by uh, the kind of depth of that move, i.e. how much it did move on that draggy press conference. So if you did get a surprisingly surprisingly strong inflation reading, you might see some upside. But if you remember, German uh, inflation yesterday was soft. So in that respect, if you get a weak number, obviously a retest of the uh, the Asia pack, late Asia pack low, early low this morning. That's definitely a crucial area to have a look at. Uh, just looking at technically, that was the Asia low here. You can see that previous point where we flashed higher there, support back on the 26th. So, could provide an interesting platform if we had a weak number, a break there, if it came back at the time for a potential classic entry targeting down at uh, S1, then maybe beyond to the lows, that double bottom that was seen in yesterday's session, the eventual target back down to Friday's low, which is more akin to the 116 handle, could be a strategy if it plays out accordingly if we have weak CPI data. In terms of the, the pound, I really wouldn't be looking at the pound too much now. Why? because A, we've just said the European data is important, so I'd be looking at the euro dollar pair as more of the instrument to trade, and B, I don't think market participants are really going to want to step in the way of the pound, not at this point when you've got the Bank of England looming uh, in the next couple of sessions ahead. Uh, I guess the one key level, let me just see if I've still got it marked up, maybe a bit longer time frame is that October level which has been a really nice one both sides support and resistance since the beginning of the month 132.50 I'd expect that probably to contain the upside barring any un unscheduled news given the fact that market participants now given the quite high degree of uncertainty about how to play this Bank of England reaction because don't forget it's not just about a rate hike it's about the composition of the vote split will give a sliding scale of how hawkish or dovish the hike is. Then you've got the minutes. Then you've got the quarterly inflation report. So it's going to be an incredibly important event, very volatile. Lots of different scenarios how that could play out, which we'll talk about lots more tomorrow. Uh, but I'm, I'd say cable is probably not going to be the most interesting because of the, the gravity of that event forthcoming. No one's going to be wanting to trade it too much at this point, I'd say. Okay, quickly just to round up the rest of the day, going into the US session, we have uh, Redbook, Kay Schiller. These are all really non-important pieces of economic data. You do have, though, the Chicago PMI. 
Um, don't forget, this gets released to subscribers before the official embargoed release, so just be mindful two and a half minutes before that comes out. You've also got US consumer confidence, and as you'll notice here from the Times, again, throughout the entirety of this week until US clocks change at the weekend, their data and market opens respectively are going to be an hour earlier than normal. Time difference between us and New York has shortened until their clocks change at the weekend. That does mean then API crude oil inventories will come at 8.30 p.m. if you are going to be sticking around for that. Okay, that's it. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, any questions, uh, just let me know. Happy to help. Otherwise, have a good day and good luck. Thank you.